Hello, Scott here, and I just want to take a moment to make a statement about something that was mentioned in the beginning of this episode you're about to listen to. During our initial discussion, I brought up the recent arrival of a copy of Empire of the Petal Throne and how excited I was to receive it. This conversation was recorded prior to the recent news regarding M.A.R. Barker's involvement with the Journal of Historical Review, an atrocious Holocaust revisionist group, and his authoring of a neo-Nazi book under a pseudonym and published with an alt-right publishing company. I think I speak for both Keith and myself that we absolutely oppose everything about Professor Barker's horrendous views and his absolutely racist and anti-Semitic propaganda. His legacy will forever be destroyed by these inexcusable revelations, and rightfully so. Like many of you, I am still trying to find my perspective on where the world of Tecumel stands with me personally, and not quite sure where to go with the game at this point in time. But I am continuing to listen to others who have spent more time with it than I have, and they are continuing to provide some guiding insight into where we go next. And with that, let's continue with Episode 7 of Tater Pigs. The Titterpigs, the RPG podcast. Am I getting paid for this one? Welcome to episode seven of Titterpigs. Here we are again. I'm Keith. And I am Scott. Scott, can you believe we have made it to episode seven? I think our honeymoon period is finally coming to an end. I think you're right. I think it's time for counseling. I think it's become evident with all of the wonderful people that we keep interviewing uh, to add a little spice into our um, podcasting love life, so to speak. So yeah, the uh, the, the seven <laughs> uh, podcast episode itch has begun. Um. Yeah, yeah. It's no longer years, it's episodes. So yeah, here we are. Uh, So as we like to do Mm -hmm. at the beginning of every one of our episodes is to catch each other up with what we've been doing since we last recorded. But first, I'm going to let Scott take the mic because since normally I usually take the pole position, I'm going to give Scott the honor tonight Yes, and let him him take the mic and tell everybody what he's been up to. Okay. So I'll try to keep it brief as possible so we can get into the, you know, the meat of this particular episode. But, um, you know, we, we do try to say that we like to remain as positive as possible, but one of my things is going to be very positive and one of them is going to be maybe just a minor complaint. So take it for what it's worth. But first off, uh, an exciting thing happened to me, uh, as far as obtaining something I've been looking for, for a long time. And that is a, a actual copy of the uh, Empire of the Petal Throne. It is the Different Worlds edition uh, that that arrived at my doorstep here a couple days ago. Uh, for those who aren't aware, Empire of the Petal Throne is the world of Tecumel. It is argu- arguably the first setting ever created for utilizing Dungeons and Dragons back in the 70s. And while this was not the God, original printing of it, yeah, it's it's old. It, it's 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 old. No, you're old. Oh, well, yeah. Well, that goes without saying. <laughs> uh, you'll be getting a letter later, by the way, for me. Um, oh, thanks. But uh, strongly worded email. But um, this is a reprint of the original rules. So the first, the original set was a a box set uh, from TSR. The wonderful thing about it is it came from someone through the TechML. Uh, Facebook group who was just looking to offload a couple things and he contacted me personally and was more than happy to part with it for an extremely re- reasonable and considerable price just to get into the hands of someone who will give it some more love and attention, which 
is me. The rarity of this book uh, can't be expressed, but likewise, within the folds of this book uh, was a map of Jakala, uh, which is very rare because, you know, usually if you get a book when you're younger, first thing you do is you pull that map out if it's attached in there and, you know, something happens to it usually. So Pristine Inside, wonderful book, absolutely ecstatic. Uh, I am a giant fan of Tecumel uh, and, you know, in, in the world they're in. Um, some people are not, but um, it is it is a wonderful setting to get, get into, and it has rekindled uh, my interest in in it as it kind of it hasn't really waned, but you know you get that new and shiny. And dude, you just... I am so glad you clarified the uh, the show notes for this, <laughs> right? Because when you put EPT, I had something else cross my mind. Hey, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that, I if... mean this. This is our honeymoon's coming to an end. I was wondering. Well, if it was that kind of EPT you're you're thinking of, this would be a different podcast because let's let's be honest, (laughs) that technically shouldn't be able to happen anymore for myself and my wife. So (laughs) we we'd have to have a little separate discussion, you know, off (laughs) podcast regarding that. But but anyway, so so that arrived. But but the the, but the wonderful thing that he also threw in was uh, speaking of the original TSR, you know, printing, which came in a box set, and also in that box came a wonderful set of very colorful and sturdy maps that are equally rare. And he had one of those maps that he just kind of threw in. Um, and it is, and it is a beautiful hex map, uh, considering that this was printed in 1975 or 1976. Uh, this thing feels like it just came off the printing press today. Absolutely. Unused and perfect. So, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of a little bit of an excitement. What's, what's been new about me. Um, but real quick, uh, another thing that I've been doing is, is I picked up my cyberpunk game, uh, cyberpunk red, utilizing the new rules by, uh, our Talsorian games. And, uh, I do love the new rules. I do love the setting. And we, we, we started the game up again on roll 20, uh, after they came out with their new compendium slash character sheet. Now, I don't really utilize a lot of the built-in aspects of roll 20, you know, even though I do pay the premium price most of the character sheets are used are all uh done by the loving people who you know create these things for a variety of reasons and sure. and they're available to use and it's a good starting point to you know for any game that you want to run on there knowing that there's a character sheet there for you but um roll 20 does their their own thing too where they will provide their own uh character sheet and usually it's free sometimes it's it, it accompanies a product that they're that they're trying to sell you Call of Cthulhu is one of them. Dungeons and Dragons, Five E is another. So Cyberpunk uh, came out with the you know with their compendium, you know, which is their version of you know the rule set you can search and utilize. All a right, wonderful assortment of 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 tokens and artwork that they provided to you, more than expected. You know, there, there's just I'm not going to be lacking for any sort of NPC or character tokens just from what they provided, uh, which which is great. But, but, but yeah. So okay, there's I was a, waiting for the but. Yeah, there's a but. Um, their character sheet, unfortunately, uh, is incomplete. By incomplete, I mean staggeringly incomplete, uh, which is a bit unfortunate because you know this 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 particular rule set uh, you're paying money for, and it was forty dollars. Uh, oh my god! And, and which you know, and you're you're getting a compendium, which obviously I know mm-hmm. someone took a lot of time to put all that information from the book into a relatively decent searchable compendium that you can Yeah, but if you don't have a character sheet to put the character on though. Right. So so there's the dots a, aren't connected. Exactly. So so there's a there's a few minor things there that are missing. Uh but the big one that is that is completely uh you know just not even on the sheet doesn't mean if it's broken or not. It's just not there is the utilization of the cyber deck for your net runner um within the game. Now the game's cyberpunk. <laughs> so not having an ind- integrated source for a product that you're paying money for in order for one of the key aspects of a character within the game that revolves around someone surfing the cyber waves of Night City, to me, just isn't right. Um, it's broken. It's broken, and I get you know that they were behind and i get that sometimes people do this this beta nonsense and i get you know sometimes things just aren't perfect but this is a key component and i and i equated it to like what if someone sold you the the player's handbook compendium in roll 20 and you had your character sheet and everything was there and integrated 
accept magic spells for your wizard. And you'd be like, w- w- what the hell? You know, why? Yeah, no, that, that means it's broken. Right. So <clears throat> intrinsically so, broken. So, yeah. So, so there's that. And, it's, and it was noted. And there's other things, minor things on there. But it was definitely noted. And they, they did state that they are working on it. But, you know, you, you pay for a product, you expect it to be finished. And, and unfortunately, Agreed. it did drag down the game that we were trying to play uh, with having to manually utilize the, the net running aspect for my net runner, which on its own is, is a bit complex as opposed to everything else within the game. And that's why you buy these things, you know, to, you know, take away some of the heavy lifting so you can keep it with the action. And cyberpunk, yeah. cyberpunk is one of those you want to keep it rolling as quick and fast as possible and everything in there is integrated except that, and then it comes to a screeching halt. So, so yeah, so that's my, you know, semi-negative, still trying to be positive, because I know they're probably going to fix it, but I mean, seriously, don't... And how long is it going to take, though? Right, and don't put a product out. I don't care who you are. You know, if there's a key aspect missing, you just can't really put something out and expect people to pay for it and not complain about it, and then come back and say, thanks for your money, We'll address this this key component issue later when we feel like it. No, it's like a you, video game. Yeah, you you can't you don't <laughs> charge for that. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, no, so, you're not wrong. But so anyway, so. so that's that's my you know that's my good thing that that happened to me since we last spoke. That's kind of my negative thing that 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 happened since we last spoke. Other things, but those are just the two that I picked out. So with that, how about you, Keith? Uh, what's 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 kind of a uh, uh, either eating at you or something that you would like to address. <laughs> I'm glad you asked. I have a, I have a good, bad, turn good story real quick. Okay. Um, so I'm sure listeners have uh, from other, that if you've listened to other episodes or have joined us in the Midchester Arms or any of our Zoom chats uh, that I've hosted, uh, you over the last mm-hmm, two years or, or thereabouts have uh, heard my, um, my bitches gripes and complaints about uh, Root the Tabletop RPG being superbly late in delivering the, the Kickstarter and have finally just had time to like go through it. Mm-hmm. I was amazed by the quality, like, you know, nice durable books. Uh, the maps are really nice. They're like wet, dry erase kind of maps, eight, eight and a half by 11. It's a, it's a nice whole package deal. Right. I was a little dismayed by the satchel that came with it. It's like a bag I would put like wet shoes and wet clothes in to go to the pool. It's like a drawstring bag yeah, with a I, shoulder strap. I, I saw it. Yeah. It, yeah. It's it's horrible. Mm-hmm. Magpie, if you're listening, um, I commented on Kickstarter. <laughs> the bag is horrible. Let's face it. It's horrible. It's not a satchel. Right. It, it's a girly pool bag. Okay. Let's, let's just well, be you, cool about it. You can use it. <laughs> You can use it to hold those very colorful and pretty dice in. So it's technically it could be yeah. considered a, a j- ridiculously large dice bag. So they, oh, I know. They know it's. Other well, I've people seen it. You can't even put all the product in it because and it doesn't hold it well. But that's not my gripe. Right. Uh, I mean that that is my gripe. But I've started to read it and okay. dismayed that it took so long to get it. I was happy to finally get it. I was happy with the quality. You know, I've just started reading the core book. I'm 48 pages into it. I was running an automation automation script in my office at like. I don't know, 5.15 this morning. Yeah. And I was going to just read a few pages while I was testing this automation script. Mm -hmm. And I can see where I've got a paper bookmark in there. Just a regular like bookstore paper bookmark you would buy. Yeah, just like a regular (laughs) thin piece of cardboard or treated Yeah, that my wife bought me. It's got like Cthulhu on it or whatever. I pulled it out and Mm -hmm. I see that the, because it has a sewn binding, but Mm -hmm. it's also reinforced with glue. Well, I can see at page 48, 49, where the bookmark had been up against the, the binding, the glue is all broken apart. Ooh. I can see the stitching, uh, you know, every uh, three eighths of an inch or whatever it is, you know, however, however it's stitched through the, the sequencing, right? Ooh. The distance between the stitches. Ooh. And I was just like, I was flabbergasted. I'm like, this is a brand new damn book. Yeah. Uh, I took a couple of pictures, shot it off to Magpie this morning before I had to go off to a safety class at work. Mm-hmm. And right before we started recording... Okay. Matter of fact, I said to you, you know, <laughs> I had not heard back from him and um, I'm happy to report uh, that right before we started recording, Magpie sent me an email mm-hmm. and they are going to replace my book. So a good news, bad news turned good news story. So right. Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at. Hopefully it's a singular issue. You I, know. I hope so. I'm going to inspect all the other books. Yeah. So it has the, I have another hardcover book, same construction. Mm-hmm. And then a saddle stitch book, but I, I don't think that's gonna obviously not gonna suffer from the the same thing because it's staples. Well, I think what they need to do is get one of the, their glue benders, you know, because I know they have air benders there, earth benders, and all those other benders for their avatar project. But maybe their glue bender <laughs> yeah. can get involved 
and he can do a little they judo need to pay chop. Him more. Yeah, or exactly. Pay more or pay so them more, so they can manipulate and control. You know, the the elemental aspect of glue. Um, yeah, something <laughs> they need to bend it better, thicker. I I, I don't know. Right. I, maybe but, it's just a one off uh, error. You know, mm-hmm. or freak thing I, I don't know i hope it's not a widespread problem but right hey i, I get it, is it what it is but it's, they're going to replace it so i'm happy it's justified to a certain degree because i know we, we've talked about this in another episode you know what you know what to expect when you're expecting type thing in regards to you know books that you've received uh depending on you know if it's a kickstarter or from other companies right and you know but the fact that it's delayed this is just kind of like you know kind of another you know kick in the uh in the nasties on top of everything else, because, you know, let's, let's yep. be honest. The reason why it was delayed was there really wasn't any reason to be fair. Um, let's, let's not get Keith started on that. Yeah, that exactly. That's for a whole, that's a main <laughs> segment thing. And I think we covered that. I, I think I covered that ad nauseum in what to expect when you're expecting a book. Right. I'd have to go back and listen, but I think I did. Yeah, exactly. So you, check out that one. I think that's episode Three, I think. Three, three. yes. Yes, it was. Because it was after the horror episode. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I. Okay. So that that was us being positive. (laughs) Yeah. We're trying. I'm trying to stay positive. I really am. I'm happy that Magpie is going to replace the game. Right. I'm happy Scott got his EPT. Yep. (laughs) You can take that for what it's worth. It's positive. (laughs) Ta-da. All right. Um, um, so, well, Scott, why don't you take us into the next segment? Man? Okay. Well, then let's let's actually end on something positive. So we're going to be rolling into another interview with a wonderful, wonderful gentleman, uh, Levi Combs. We had an absolute blast, uh, you know, talking with him about a variety of things, and I honestly think that you are going to enjoy this episode. And when you're done, you're going to want to find out more about Levi Combs and Planet X Games. Hi, welcome back to Titter Pigs. Uh, Scott and I have a new special guest with us. We are hanging out with Levi Combs. I hope I said that right, Levi. <laughs> yes, sir. Hello, everyone. Right. I got yes. it. Mr. Planet X himself. And I just want to say, um, uh, apparently the honeymoon is over with Keith and I because we cannot get enough of having guests on this podcast. And so... I know who would have thunk, you know, so this, this is kind of our, you know, our, our seven year itch is we're already going through counseling. So, so Levi, can you help <laughs> us save this marriage? <laughs> Our marriage I'm sorry, made guys, you hell. are on your own. <laughs> oh, shit. Damn it. Oh, well, but yes. Uh, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> That's welcome. It. I welcome. want half the game collection. <laughs> yeah. Over my dead body. I'll burn it right now. Um, Welcome, 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 Mr. Combs, Levi. It's it's fantastic to have you here. I'm I'm glad that you're on on Titter Pigs to uh, just chit chat. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's you you know, we kind of reached out and uh, just you know wanted to just hang, which is great. Uh, it saves us, you know, the the onus of if this thing goes down the tubes, it's your fault, not ours. Um, so uh, that's 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 where we're at. But um, but no, welcome. Um, so before we dive in, I just, you know, I'm going to go ahead and just take the mic here for a minute. I have been, and this is a confession part of the show, I've been a big fan of yours for a while. Um, you know, we, we've exchanged conversations online through the various social medias and whatnot. Um, absolutely, you know, you know, was love your sense of humor, the way you handle, you handle yourself on social media and all that good stuff. And, you know, just just kind of like, and for, for for lack of uh, you know confessing to being a stalker, somewhat of a kindred soul, just just I get a laugh every day that I see your posts, love your games, and just just a big fan. So this is a little bit extra special for me having you on the podcast to fi- finally you know meet you in virtual person. So that out of the way, um, let's, oh, man, are that, you done? Are that, you done having <laughs> a fanboy moment? <laughs> Yes. No, that is incredibly kind of you to say, man. I'm yes. I'm very flattered. So thank you. Great. Excellent. So, so you can take take your take your finger off the nine and the one. Uh, we don't need to call you know press the other one now. The, the stalker the stalker part of the show is over. Uh, but no, but welcome, 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 welcome. So having you here, we're we're going to go through the usual rigmarole. Uh, you know, because we're new to this this uh, podcast thing. Uh, Keith and we I have claim a, that for much longer, Scott. Oh, we can always claim it. <laughs> we can pretend to claim it. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll go through the usual, you know, the little questionnaire for those who don't know you. And we'll just kind of, 
you know, who you are, um, you know, what, what is it that you do? And then sure. we'll just kind of, kind of take it from there. So, um, you know, take, take the mic and, and it's, it's all yours. Well, that's quite the lead in. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to leave everybody high and dry here. There's not much to say. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So Levi Combs, I am the, um, head writer, the creative head and the publisher over at planet X games. Mm-hmm. Um, we make adventure modules for five E and OSR, just started dipping our toes into DCC as well because uh, we love that system. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I do uh, zines mm-hmm. and uh, working on some other stuff like uh, like uh, some uh, system neutral stuff and mm-hmm. uh, uh, hopefully a box set uh, coming coming next year. So Ooh. we'll uh, yeah, maybe we, we we might get a chance to talk about that later. Who knows? Excellent, um, excellent. But yeah, it's 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 weird fantasy. Um, I enjoy a. Um, uh, I call it the grindhouse style. It's really just kind of a cinematic approach to um, to to your games. Yes, I'll, I like to go fast, fast, fast. Uh, not e- not eat up too much time with uh, with with combat um, or you know or what I consider to be like things your character would already know. You mm-hmm. know, if you're looking for a secret door and there's a secret door, you know it's there. I know it's there. <sighs> Do we need to really go through five minutes of rolls and uh, and checking every Every, every 10 foot uh, space to see if it's there. Probably not. Let's speed it up. Right. Uh, as long as everything is fair and balanced and, and good for everybody. Uh, I like to keep things rolling. So that's this, that cinematic uh, style that I'm talking about. Fantastic. And, and Keith, I mean, I'm a big fan of that. Obviously Keith, you know, applauding. Oh my God. I'm such a big of, fan of that. He, he loves, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and I mean, it's each their own. Uh, I do enjoy both sides of that coin. I mean, I, I enjoy a good game where we're rolling for particular things, but also, you know, being, you know, uh, men of certain age or people of certain age, and we have lives, we have children, we have jobs, and we just don't have eight to 16 hours on a Saturday to sit down with our buddies anymore to spend the time rolling dice over and over again. So let's oh, to go back to those days. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. I wish I could. But you know what? In my mid 40s, late 40s, I, I, I just can't. It's just not going to happen. I, I like that course correction mid to late, uh, whatever. <laughs> uh, but, uh, no, that's, that, that's fantastic. So, so let's do a little bit of just a little tiny bit of history. You know, I know a lot of podcasts do this and I, I, I'm also in, interested in myself. So sure. what led you to RPGs? You know, how, how old were you? What was your first game? And just kind of, you know, just give a little insight into what that might be. Oh yeah. No, um, I remember it well, uh, it was 1983. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, there was a garage sale down the street from my house. I, I grew up in a very small town in Arkansas. So, okay. um, you know, when I say the deep South, I mean the deep, the kind that you see in the movies, you know, with the, mm-hmm. uh, with all the, the snake handling and all that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like mm-hmm. really, really uh, deep South. Um, very small uh, town. I, I graduated with 17 people. I mean, wow. that, that kind of small, very, very small. Paddle faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, banjos in the air. Um, so, uh, I went to a, a garage sale down the street from uh, the house with my mom. Um, she was picking out some stuff and I saw this book, the monster manual. It's the one that we all know and, and love from, uh, first edition AD and D, you know, with all the monsters, the blue cover, you know, this, the purple worm and the, you know, the red dragon. Um, I saw that I had no idea what role playing was, had no idea what dungeons and dragons was, but opened it up and just started looking at all these monsters. And I was just fascinated. There was the beholder, the black pudding, the demons, the devils, the dragons. Uh, you know, it just kept going on and on, and getting cooler and cooler. Um, now, I was a monster kid, anyways. I was always that kid that was like, you know, sitting on the dog food reading Starlog while my mom was checking out at Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> if we, you know, I- any kind of uh, comic book that would come into our town or that I could get at the used bookstore or uh, any issue of Fangoria that would show up at the supermarket, you know, or whatever. I was always just trying to snatch those up. So I was a you know, big monster movie fan, big monster kid. So a book all about monsters, um, even if I had no context for what any of these were, uh, was just fascinating to me. Wow. So yeah, that was my entry. See, I got my start in 1983 too, but mine wasn't the the monster man. Mine was uh, Frank Mentzer's Red Box. Well, so. that came shortly after, believe it or <laughs> not, because uh, um I found, so I found, uh, obviously found Dungeons and Dragons through that. Um, and then somehow, I don't know if it was, uh, I ordered it on a, um, an ad for the red box. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I, I saved up my lawn mowing money and sent it away and got the red box in. But here's the kick is that when the red box came in, there were no dice. Like the, oh. my, the dice were missing. Oh no. Um, so without That's the horrible. context of the dice, like not knowing right. uh, for years, like for years, I played D and D with no dice. We just flip coins. We're like, okay, well, heads you hit, tails you miss. You know, there was just no like, you know, sometimes you just made it up. There's a lot of storytelling. But that's kid you know? ingenuity right there, though. That's that's mm-hmm. that DUI stuff that eventually leads to who a lot of the people that are producing the games today, too. Well, so, yeah. well yeah. And you, and you also got to think the only two books that I had were the Monster Manual, which is AD&D. And then right. I had that Red Box, which is just, you know, BX, basically, you know, basic D&D. So. Right. They and they really don't mix as far as like hard no. like you know you, you can kind of like you know what hit points are you know what armor class is but mm-hmm. other than that like it wasn't you know there was like I said it was a lot of storytelling <laughs> there was yeah. no no hardcore math but I still owe that rust all. monster an ass kicking <laughs> yes <laughs> very much so oh, we've all been oh, there wow. on that one oh my god yeah so Man, that that is fantastic. awesome did you did you um. So besides like fantasy, right? Did you get into other stuff in you know in the other genres like horror or sci-fi, like or is just fantasy like your you know your Let's lane to play so, in? So in '83, I was nine, and I don't I don't think it was until I was fifteen that um, I met another group of people like from outside, my kind of like my little circle of friends um, that pl- that had played D and D before. So we had this family that moved into, into our town <clears throat> and their dad had been um, in the Air Force, and the Army One and had been all around. And he had he had three kids and two of those kids played D&D with her dad. Nice. Um, so, I, you know, I, I go over to their house. They've got all these books. It's like, I was like, oh, hey, I have that book. You know, like I, they're like, you play D&D. And so, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, I've been playing D&D for years. And then I very quickly found out that I did, had no idea what <laughs> actual real D&D <laughs> Uh, what other people around the world were playing. Um, yeah. So, so at 15, um, I was able to, I, I got to play quite a, quite a bit of a first edition uh, over the next couple summers. And then second edition came out. Right. And then when second edition hit, that was when like, I, you know, I was old enough to, to have friends who had a car or, mm-hmm. you know, to, you know, to have enough actual you know money from a job to st- start picking up books on the reg. So right. um yeah, that's re- second edition. Uh, after my those couple of years of 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 one e, that's really when it kicked in for me. That sounds very similar to my experience because that was about the same time second edition came out, and you know we had the the milk crate. You know oh, there yeah. was the D and D milk crate that just was being hauled back and forth to whoever's house that was hosting it during that time, yes. and and everyone's books. It was a communal thing. You know there were copies of stuff, and everything was just kind of thrown in and. Uh, it, it was great times and, and, but, but yeah, it, but to be fair, that also led to missing stuff, uh, oh, over yeah. the years. Yeah. That was my military got, days. Like yeah. living in the barracks, I had the milk crate and then we'd go to somebody's apartment and then to somebody else's barracks room. And then, yeah, mm-hmm. like things came and things went and things got added yeah. and yeah, surpluses and minuses. <laughs> I, yeah, I still have exactly. books. I don't even know whose they originally were. Oh, oh, say, hey, man, where's my unearthed arcana? Uh, uh, it was at your house. <laughs> no, where is it? You know. So yeah, those. Yeah, those were those were great. But it's funny that you mentioned the milk crate because mm-hmm. um, this family ha- had that milk crate, but you know, it was only about half full of of A D and D books. So those first mm-hmm. edition books, there was quite a bit of. I guess you'd call it third party stuff. I mean, we have, we're all these right. days are used to third party stuff, you know, it's, it's yeah. everywhere, but back then there wasn't that much third party stuff, mm-hmm. but he had a bunch of tra- uh, dragon tree press stuff in there. And mm-hmm. he had those first three Arduin books, the Arduin oh, grimoire books. Nice. And those out of all the books it was the dungeon master's guide. And those three books that really captured my imagination. Now I couldn't understand at all what was happening in the Arduin books because they're so haphazard and yeah. you know you'll have uh, one minute it's, it's it's a class and another minute you know the next page it's a i don't know like a seven page treatise on prismatic walls you know <laughs> and you're like we, I, we, we haven't even talked about critical hits yet you know so yeah it was just a mish, this crazy mishmash but they made those those books made such a huge impression on me that um there's and that they're just so ingrained in my rpg dna as a, as as it were um, that I, I find them inseparable from, from the early days of D and D for me. 
we've at least me, but we've kind of found that those who were lucky enough to discover and, and have uh, the Arduin trilogy rolled into their D and D experience, it's it has become like uh, inseparable. In, in oh, fact, yeah. at this at this moment in time, I know we could pause and say hi, Andy. Because I know his ears are perking up if he's listening to this. Because he's, oh, yeah. I mean, our, our, the Arduin trilogy is is you know a cornerstone for his experience. Also, for me, it, it wasn't, um, be, and for no other reason, uh, it just wasn't available at our game store. Uh, I may have been a little, yeah, maybe a year or two. Well, I'm not going to say younger or older, but uh, it just wasn't. Now, if you went went a little bit farther south to Long Beach, of course, you would have been able to pick it up down there, but it just never hit us. Uh, but, uh, I wish it did, you know, like so many things in my RPG midlife crisis, I'm rediscovering things that I never touched upon in my youth while playing and so many wonderful things that, uh, you know, that's still hold up to this day that oh, yeah. give even, even as much of a disorganized mess it is, if you do the mining and take the time, you will find invaluable stuff in those things that surpass oh, so many things 100 yeah. percent um and as a matter of fact i'll go so far as to say if it's not not only the third party stuff but all, for mm-hmm. all the stuff that was available back then you know whether or not it was greyhawk and blackmore and all, all this all this setting stuff mm-hmm. i find hargraves arduin grimoires i find them to be um the most interesting um of all those books, you know, more so than Greyhawk, more so than, than Blackmore, more so than uh, uh, Mel or you know, any, any of those, like I say, I said, third party um, right. or, or core um, uh, game worlds. Arduin right. to me, like <laughs> there'd be no Planescape without Arduin. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like That's Planescape fair. draws so much of, of what is cool about it directly from from arduin this whole multiversal you know craziness and one place at the center of everything right. um it's like it's west coast D like distilled to yeah. its most pure like it's just awesome you mm-hmm. know i love it yeah yeah no and 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 for those listening who haven't discovered it, you you can find you know um i believe there are pdfs that you can get there's there's a reprinting of it it's not the same but if you can find an inexpensive copy, I know it's hard to do, but even, even if the covers deteriorating and the inside still are holding up, the information Buy inside it. is more valuable than just the yeah. look of it. So pick it up yeah. for sure. It's, 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 worth the, it's worth the investment. It right. really is. Yeah, th- those books, man, I, w- I would take those things and I would just, like you were talking about mining them for, for like right. ideas and plot hooks mm-hmm. and stuff. I would spend hours doing that, writing down names or locations and then the ideas that I had for stuff probably had little or nothing to do with what was, you know, Hargrave probably had, you know, in his, in his own home, home campaign. But mm-hmm. man, I was just, uh, I loved, I loved the way that, um, you know, that he brought everything together, you know, right. it, it, it did, didn't matter, you know, to, to him, it didn't matter, um, you know, where, where stuff was coming from, as long as it was mm-hmm. fun, you know, and as long as it was imaginative and you just get so much of that from, from the art of the books. It's, it's, yeah, they're great. Right. And, and, and then later you would get them from TSR and their lawyers would neither confirm nor deny <laughs> that's where they got it from. But uh, it's pretty obvious they did. So, uh, so to piggyback, I want to piggyback off of that, though. So obviously mm-hmm. the, the Arduin is like a cornerstone kind of piece for you, right? Would you say that Arduin has um, influenced your own writings for, for Planet X Games, your products? Oh, a thousand percent. Absolutely. Okay. Like I was just, uh, I mean, I kind of suspected day, like, that, but <laughs> like if I had never found those three, three books, I'd never met those guys with that, that milk carton. I, there, I have no, no doubt that I would never be doing any of this. I would not have gone beyond high school playing D and D like I, I, cause I played it all through the military. And then when I got out and I always kind of had, even when I was, wasn't really actively playing, I always had like one little foot, you know, one dipping one little toe into the D and D waters. I'd read like nights at the dinner table or something. And that was like, what kept me there. Right. You know, it, oh, I remember that. I, I went through that phase too. I mean, and I still read nights <laughs> at the dinner table because it's, 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 it's genius. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I, in, as a matter of fact, I was, I was kind of out of, of, uh, of games for there for a couple of years. Like mm-hmm. all the friends that I was playing with had moved away. Um, you know, the game stores around me really weren't carrying anything that were, that was you know, really um, uh, stimulating me. And I was just kind of, kind of just reading the same old stuff over and over. And I didn't have any to play with, you know, and there were no zooms, you know, where you could, you could find a game online. 
So uh, I was pretty much out. And then I went to Barnes and Noble one day um, looking for something to read. And there was this uh, flimsy little like um, module and it was the second in a series. It was, it was Rappanathic, you know, the mm. dungeon of graves. It was just this flimsy little, you know, I don't know, 48 page thing. Mm. Uh, and I picked it up because it had Orcus on the cover. And I was like, what? I've never seen Orcus on the cover of anything. <laughs> he was my, he's my favorite of all the, all, all the demon Lords. I like right. they, they're calling, they're calling them demons again. This is amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah so I, I picked that up and that, I, I, that just plunged me right back into it. I was like, finally something, you know, that, uh, that I can it kind of takes me back to the old days of nostalgia, but at the same time, something new. So I really got into back into D and D around that time. Right. No, that's, that's awesome. I, I think we all, and, 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 and this is true of anyone. I, I think it's very rare that you get someone who has a really consistent, uh, gaming experience from inception to, you know, later on in age, like we are, everyone kind of has their downtime work, military, family, all, all those things. Uh, you know, if someone does, you know, bless you and, and you know, you're, you're lucky, but there, there's, a, there, it's always been in the background, whether if I'm, you know, during my downtime, if I wasn't running games or playing games or even involved in RPGs, I was still playing RPG video games. I was still yeah. reading <laughs> materials, not necessarily playing it, but I was still picking up the occasional book, monitoring things, looking at things, and then you know, once, you know, a little bit of that personal, personal life responsibility, you know, ebbed out a little bit, then kind of dip back in maybe a little bit later for me. Um, so when you, when you had your downtime, you came back in, I assume that, that, you know, that was prior to, you know, the beginning of the, the OSR movement. Um, were you oh, yeah. there for, were you there in the beginning days of that? And, how long after that before you were starting to get involved in, you know, in what would be Planet X games, you know, today? So, <clears throat> oh, so yeah. So the, when I got back into it with, with, with rap and ethic and started reading mm -hmm. all those, I started going to cons. I was living mm -hmm. in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the time. We had this, um, this tiny little con there called Conestoga. Um, <laughs> yeah. I love, and, I uh, love con names. <laughs> yeah. They're <laughs> that, great. Awesome. They're wonderful. Um, yeah, so I was, was going to this, uh, you know, was going to this small con. I'd been a couple of years, and I would, uh, my a friend and I would run a 24 hour Rappanathic game. Now, he, I'd run six hours, he'd run six hours back, back and forth until 24. And, you know, whoever stayed in the longest, we, you know, we gave him a special, like a book or whatever, a prize, or mm -hmm. we had all, all of our little prizes and all our little extras and bells and whistles that we would do for the game. But that's how we got people to come to our, our game because. A, nobody knew who we were. So we would right. have the spectacle of the 24 hour rapid ethic uh, marathon. So while I was doing that, I think the second or third year that we did it, um, <clears throat> I got up to leave to go. To, I would call, call the break, got up to leave to go to the bathroom. I came back. There's this dude running my game with all the <laughs> players and he's killing them. Now, usually <laughs> especially back in those days that that's a that's a big problem you know oh yeah <laughs> um, but you know I, I i you know just got got my my wits about me and it uh, took a minute i say hey, man look can, can i talk to you for a second you know um turns out it was casey christopherson who was um he was just just joking with me um right. but he was one of the um uh, the developers and kind of the, he was, he's with the frog, with the frog God games, oh, God. which was necromancer games at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, Oh, my name's right here in the book. I'm just, I'm just joshing with you. I'm just playing. And so, you know, it was funny. Ha ha ha. But after the game was over, we got to talking and then mm -hmm. we became friends and we just kept in touch for, for many, many years. Right. And uh, so, you know, over, over several years of friendship, <clears throat> I eventually asked myself, I've got some ideas for some stuff and I'm kind of interested about maybe coming to work for a necromancer or a frog god or, or another publisher. Uh, you've been with them a long time. You, they seem to treat you really, really, really well. Um, what do you think? He's like, well, sure. Send me what you got and I'll, you know, I'll help you. I'll run it up the flagpole, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. um, so I sent them um, at what I had for the treatment at the time for uh, a, an adventure called Jungle Tomb of the Mummy Bride. And I sent it to them and um, look, they get this stuff all the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, Show they get this kind of, no, no, no. They get this kind of stuff all the time. You know, they right. have a uh, hundred people a year asking them, Hey, I've got a cool idea for a module. Sure. I only was able to get my foot in the door because I knew Casey, but even Casey was like, you know, Hey, I've got this guy. I, I really like what he's written. I like what he does. I think he could be an asset. 
but they got mm-hmm. stuff going on. You know, they've got, of course, you know, they've got a full schedule of products going back two, three years, you know? Um, and again, nobody knew who I was. So um, he's like, look, they, they'll buy it, but they're going to, they're going to strip this stuff out that, you know, this, this, all this kind of subtext and stuff. And they're going to, you know, they're, they're going to heavily edit it. So my advice to you would be to just put it out yourself. And I'm like, Oh well, man, I, I can't do that. I, you know, I'm just a, just a guy working a job in a, you know, in a, in a small town. And he was like, no, no, no. So like, just go on Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what's a Kickstarter? I had no <laughs> idea what Kickstarter was. So, so thanks to Casey Christopherson, mm-hmm. he held my hand, basically walked me through the Kickstarter process. He helped me edit the book. He got me artists that I could, uh, that would deliver and I could trust on time. He went over it himself and gave me, gave me notes. He answered those phone calls in the middle of the night when I was like stressing, like, I don't know what to do here. Or, Am I going to end up living in my car in the at a Taco Bell parking lot because I <laughs> messed up the shipping? He's like, calm down, mm-hmm. calm down. And basically he held my hand and hand walked me through this entire process. Right. And in the process, like he hooked me up with other people who were already professionals. Like I had some questions about, um, about hosting the PDF and hosting images. And uh, he's like, well, Hey, I think, I think Matt Finch knows something about that. Right. And so I, you know, Matt just took my call blind. It was so nice to me. He was just very, very um, giving and open with his time. Um, and as we all know, he's like one of the fathers of the OSR. So right. um, just see, he was just super cool to me. And then I remember Jeff Tolanian gave me some really good advice um, about after Kickstarter is over another, another time when, when one of these guys is a very prolific and well-known creator um, mm-hmm. just took, you know, time for, for somebody they did not know and just gave them really, really good advice. Um, so from that, I was able to, to start publishing. I published my first module and then pretty quickly after that, I, I had some, some of the stuff written and um, I went from there. Cool. That is wow. a great creation story. <laughs> I mean, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah that is that is fantastic Uh oh did we lose lose him for oh a no oh no did we lose Levi? no oh there we go you're back okay <laughs> Levi's there perfectly fine yeah yeah for, for those who don't know when we do guests we do this over zoom uh so we're you know things we're gonna go however the, the internet allows us to to hey. go so pear so don't, shape don't, square don't, yeah, don't, add us. don't don't email us don't say hey your sound cut out your the guy who edited it sucks which is usually me or keith or it's usually, usually keith usually always us <laughs> or actually it is always us it is so, always yeah. us we're our like, own production team internet. no that I, I mean wow i mean that's that's fantastic and i i would dare say that i mean your experience as fantastic as it was for you is similar to other people that, that I've spoken to over, you know, over the years in regards to those, those names that you reference and their ability to at least give a small amount of their personal time to help someone else do what they're doing. And it's, it's good to know that, uh, you know, this is not a flash in the pan thing. They do that for a lot of people, you know, when they have the time, cause they're all running, they all have personal lives, they're all running businesses, they're all doing different things, but they will at some point, as soon as they get a moment to breathe, will will do that. And that's that's always refreshing to hear that that you know um that story kind of you know told again and again uh in, in regards to that. And you don't you don't see that a lot of times in, in other creative aspects, um, especially in in the writing world and in the creative mm-hmm. world it could be really cutthroat <laughs> in regards yeah to no that, absolutely so. especially in comics uh it's it's very can be very very cutthroat oh, um God, yes. i've had some horror stories related to me by um by a few artists that i work with who are yeah who came from the comics world um but you know listen uh, uh tabletop rpgs it's different um mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, my friend Skeeter Green. Um, he did uh, some great stuff, Crypt of the Science Wizard, and um, you know he's worked for Necromancer for and Fraud the Frogs for for, for many years. He said uh, something that resonated with me at at the at the my first con as a publisher. Um, he said, um, "We're all just different versions of the same guy," you know. And he's right. You know, we all have, you know, we all started with those, you know, with some version of D and D or some version of something like D and D, you know, right. Um, especially the older, you know, the older 40 something late forties uh, <laughs> crowd. Yeah. Uh, we, we all come from the same, same yeah. source code, you know? Yeah. So it's, um, 
you that know, it's, it's refreshing to see. Yeah. And, 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 and I know it's like when I asked you, like, what brought you to the RPG world? And granted, the story is kind of, it's different for everyone, but it's kind of almost just a retelling of the same story. It's almost like, like, like mythology, you know, and things such as that is it's generally come from the same seed, but, but the story of, of, you know, Heracles over here is different than the story of Hercules over there. Uh, and of course I'm saying I'm Hercules, uh, but, uh, but, <laughs> we let but, but, but that. I know exactly. Uh, but, but, I'm but it, it is the same thing when you say what, and, and it's different, you know, when we talk to people over in the UK, what brought you in the RPGs, it is usually a different game, but it's still kind of the same The story. Nexus is still the same, though. Right. Yeah, exactly. it could be Warhammer, or, you know, whatever, you know. Or right. Rune but Quest yeah. or Call of Cthulhu, but, but, that, but the Nexus story is very, very similar, mm -hmm. regardless if it's Germany or the UK or the US. It's, it's a very similar right. creation story, in a sense. Right, and, so, and, it, and it's unifying, and it, it makes yeah. it makes a... You know, it allows us to make those those connections, so to speak, with with you know those those un, you know those unwritten and not necessarily needing to verbalize these connections. Like you know, you just kind of nod and know. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's like we're, it's like we're all variants of the same of the same kid in 1983 that was uh, finding that game for the first time. Right. <laughs> we're all just variants, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> but for the you know, record, Keith wants to say in 1983 and 1984, I had variations. Of Egbert, that was my character's name all the time. Egbert, Egbert. <laughs> no, <laughs> hey, listen, no, we've all been there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Egbert has a question. No, Keith has a question. <laughs> um, all right. So you know, you did the, you know, you had your first Kickstarter, right? And so your kind of creation story with coming to Kickstarter with the help of a lot of you know industry folks that you know gave of their time and stuff. But obviously, Planet X Games. That, that's the Nexus story of Planet X Games. So here you are today, you know, mid-March 2022, and Flactory 4 is sitting out there in Kickstarter. Yeah. And, you know, and, and banging it out and, you know, and doing really, really well. Uh, I pulled it up. You know, you're, you, you smashed through your pledge goal that you, you wanted. And uh, why don't you take a, take a few minutes and tell listeners what, what, Flact what the Flactory series is. <laughs> um, cause obviously you're on number four, so, you know, right. you're obviously doing well with it. So what, what is phylactery? Cause I know Scott's a fan of it. Um, I followed it on, you know, every time an issue comes up on Kickstarter, I'm going to, uh, admit <laughs> I don't own any. So uh, <laughs> that's all right, man. <laughs> no, listen, the flat, it's a, it's, first of all, it's is a zine. It's a 48 page, um, color cover, but black and white interior zine. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it, the, the, the genesis of the phylactery zines comes from reading those Arduin grimoire, um, those little brown books and those Dragon Tree Press um, supplements, you know, all that, all the, you know, the book of plots and the book of, uh, um, gosh, what was the book of plots, book, book of spells. There was all these mm -hmm. different, you know, these different uh, third party sources. Mm -hmm. And I'm mixing that with, with, with D and D it just like, again, fueled me with the kind of an alternate take on things um, that I don't think the mainstream uh, gamer uh, always necessarily had. Um, but for me, uh, the idea behind it is that it's a quick and easy resource. You know, it's something that you can bring straight to the table. Um, we've like, we were talking earlier, we're all busy. We all have, you know, wives and, <clears throat> kids and jobs and hobbies and we don't always have time to devote you know three or four hours of game prep you know into in, in, into getting ready for a game so what you can do with the phylactery is you can bring literally any issue and it's going to have four monsters it's going to have a mini scenario it's going to have a hex crawl there's going to be npcs magic items fantastic locations secret organizations it's all put in there and kind of a catch as you can catch style mm -hmm. um where you can take what you need and then ditch the rest. Some of it is right. interconnected, but it's, 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 that's, you know, it doesn't live all the material inside one issue doesn't live and die on the rest of the material. Right. You can just kind of, uh, you know, piece it out. And uh, again, it's just a, a really quick and easy resource. You can pull ideas, plot hooks, and uh, that sort of stuff directly plug and play right into your gaming table. Oh, wow. Okay. Fantastic. Now I know what I've been missing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but now I'm kind of sad. I've been missing it. Uh, <laughs> and, and, well, because I love and, 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 Scott knows I love those resources. I mean, that's that's yeah. the kind of that's the kind of zine Keith likes. I don't uh, zines that to me zines that are a piece of like 
I don't know, a mega dungeon, right? That I've got to wait, you know, five years to get the whole damn thing so I can put it all together so then I can run it. Right. The, as, as a game reviewer, irritate the crap out of me sometimes. Uh, not always, but sometimes they do. But something that I can take that I can just, I can take this piece and that piece and this oh. piece and, oh shit, I need something to fill this gap. Oh, there's something there. Those, those are the kind of things I like. So and it's it's written in that first edition uh, advanced Dungeons and Dragons rules, you know, mm -hmm. and because for me those are the um, uh, those are the most easily accessible, you know. Okay. You can t it, you know that's it's almost again like a source code. You can you can look at those and you know what hit points, and armor class, and all, all this stuff you know means, right? Um, you know, and you have this gigantic you know. Uh, backlog of products that, that could support it, you know, um, and it appeal. It, plus it appeals to me. It appeals to, you know, um, the kind of games that I like to run. I think it's very OSR friendly, um, mm -hmm. you know, both for, for new players and for old players. So uh, to me that go, going, going one E AD and D was just kind of a win because it's so close to OSC or any of those other games. Anyways, you know, that's what everybody's playing now <laughs> or Osric or swords and wizardry. It's right. You know, it, 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 you're not having to jump through, hoops to make something uh, usable yeah. for whatever you're running and it's i can and, use and my so, osc advanced yes. and, and some people will will say you know well then it's just made design for a D, &D you know such as there's that there's that age-old argument you know what qualifies as osr that, that kind of nonsense mm -hmm. but 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 to be perfectly fair those those people just like to complain because i mean anyone can look at like you know the stats for you know holly oakenspear and no yeah. these are these are these are D, &D stats but I mean, it's not going to require a lot of leaps and bounds if you're playing, you know, a skill based system to just do what you need to do. Take five minutes, do what you need to do to convert that. But you, you've got, you know, four paragraphs here of, you know, of wonderful, useful information for a, an evocative character that will fit in any fantasy setting, regardless of the stats. Uh, and the other thing I'll, I'll add to it, which which I know Keith enjoys is. It's full of all this wonderful information, but there's a there's this wonderful injection of humor uh, yep. throughout throughout, and 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 you and that there's nothing more evident than that than than you know one of your more recent uh, uh, books that you came out with that that I backed, uh, Magic and Shit, no. uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> which which literally just you know what's I don't even need to tell anyone what's in there. Uh, it, what's that book about? Magic and shit. And they go, oh, I get spells, the vibe just from the title. Spells, magic items. I'm like, do I need to repeat myself? Magic and shit. So yeah, so you're you're going to find, you know, uh, a lot of wonderful information in these books. Um, and I'll get we'll get to this in a minute because the, the artwork. Uh, you you do have a wonderful group of artists that that you have in these in in these books that you know I I I, I and whatever you're you're paying them double it uh <laughs> but, Absolutely. Uh, but uh but yeah but i mean it's just just you know the it's you know all the games that that, that i play and always have a little bit of, of humor involved in it whether it be just you know breaking the fourth wall because it gets a little bit intense or just just humor in general uh because it's no one likes to be you know we're too old to be edgelords anymore let's 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 I do not. I do not fit in my leather pants anymore. So it just it just doesn't work. Um, we'll have to talk about that when we get to the Nephilim game. <laughs> but uh, but no. So you're you're you're. It's it's one of those things where I think you kind of nailed it. It's it, even though, like you said, Arduin was not just necessarily a. Here's a bunch of stuff to use for your game. It was you know here's some stuff. Here's my opinion on something. Here's some tables. Here's a character class. Here's a here's a dungeon. Here's a, here's a bunch of stuff. And every once in a while, it'll take a tangent to something that's not necessarily game, you know, related or not game usable, but it's something to, you know, keep the gears running and something to think about. And, you know, that's kind of, you know, although the layout is 100% better. Uh, un un unfortunately, I, I un unlike in Arduin, I do miss the occasional carriage return that just didn't line up with the next line as... That that poor woman was typing it down on her typewriter, but Aww. maybe for maybe for another zine. So, uh, but yeah, um, so yeah, I mean, so that's yeah, Flactory. That's that's there. There's that. Uh, but I, I do got a, a question though, kind of also in regards to, to Planet X um, games. Is you sure. had mentioned you had mentioned that you know Jungle Tomb of the Mummy Bride was so was that your your first kind of legit venture into publishing something? 
Yeah. So that was the very first Kickstarter. That was the one that, um, you know, they were like, Hey, we'll, we'll buy it. But, and then my buddy Casey told me like, well, you should just do it yourself. You know, so, there's no re if you have any, any, any sort of, um, if you have any sort of, <laughs> um, work ethic you'll just right. do it yourself man um so he, he lit a fire under me and after i got done feeling sorry for myself i went and uh i went and published it <laughs> so, so yeah was it always was, was it always designed for 5e uh or was it something it's a did great it, question it's yeah a great question um yeah. originally that was originally written in believe it or not third edition rules 3.5 that's oh, how wow. i originally wrote it uh, and I, and I sat on it and tweaked it for years, you know, just mm -hmm. a little, I was running it for my friends and, um, you know, I, oh, this part's terrible. I mean, let me take that out. You know, let me mm -hmm. add something. It got to where it kind of its final form where it's at now. Right. Um, but then, uh, I, I met a guy that Casey hooked me up with, mm -hmm. um, who converted it for me. And okay. then I started, I started play testing it as a, as a fifth edition adventure. I was like, oh, this actually works even better <laughs> as a fifth yes, edition. It does. So. <laughs> nice. So do you, do you currently, do you play with any 5e games or was a conversion? Cause I mean, that was the first one. And then of course came other ones like the occurrence and howling crater and, and so on that were exclusively, or at least at the time, and I could be mistaken, were designed as, you know, third party al alternative adventures for fifth edition rule set. Totally. Uh, so was, was that after you did that, was, was that your goal to maintain that and provide for that, for, for that particular rule set? Cause I know you, you've branched out from there. I, you know, it's, now you've got the, you know, you've got the jungle tomb of the mummy bride for DCC. Um, did you do another one that was for something more OSR like swords and wizards, wizardry or am I mistaken? No. Um, so I have four, I have four um, five E adventures. There's a uh, mm -hmm. jungle tomb of the mummy bride. An occurrence of Howling Crater, mm -hmm. Glimmering Crypt of the Iron King, and yes. then um, Escape from Skullcano Island. Right. Uh, which by far was the most difficult to write because it's high level. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so we could talk about that, but man, let me tell you, like, I'll just sidebar real quick. Right. High level adventures are tough to write, brother. I'm oh, telling yes. you. <laughs> <laughs> they are rough. Um, anyways, uh, but yeah, I, I did a only one DCC. Um, book it was a dcc compatible version of the mummy bride book the next one i'm right. going to do is, is howling crater for dcc okay, okay um, cool. i've got the okay to do that and then um i've done some osr stuff um smaller just you know in the flactory mm -hmm. has they had those flactory books have hex crawls and everyone has a mini adventure in it mm -hmm. um i just ran the one the mini adventure from issue four um on a live stream the other night and it was mm -hmm. great you know we had a great time Excellent. Man, so um but yeah, so the, you've got uh, 5e, uh, OSR, you know, mm -hmm. rough. You could, you could with, with what's in the flight, you could run an ostrich game. You could run an OSC yeah. game out of that. You could run a Swords and Wizardry game out of that. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, DCC. Right. So I, I guess, so do you, uh, do you play any 5e? Do you run it? Because like I, I personally, myself, I've, uh, I've run it. I don't play it. I, I run pretty much right now. I, I'll run it for my kids because that's my kids are you know teenagers and then and their friends sure. and that's kind of what they enjoy. Um, and I ran an extensive five E campaign during COVID as a favor to my friend who owns a game store here. Uh, it was one of the it was he was it was a way to help supplement his income. It was like five dollars a head, and the sure. people were more than happy to do it. They got store credit. Long story short, ran a ran a long third party campaign. Um, uh, and, um, eventually just kind of petered out after, you know, thankfully COVID starting to subside. But, um, so, so do you do anything in 5e as far as outside of just creating these games? I mean, I, I guess, oh, yeah. okay. So I, I guess my, where I'm leading, he's versatile, where I'm leading this is towards why I, why I like this, why, why I like what, what planet X does for 5e and what other people do is um and it, you know by all means keith can mute me at any time i will uh, <laughs> I, I i i'm not i'm not gonna pull you know pull you into this but i am i enjoy 5e i enjoy 5e as a rule set i think it's solid i think it's good i think it what it's done for you know all, and i'm just going to say what everyone else says what it's done for the hobby is fantastic um and I could care less about any of the other nonsense uh, that, that people feel about Watsi. That doesn't bother me at all. My whole thing is, is they, what they've done eventually has made their current line of adventures for the rule set 
boring. Um, and so what you provide is this and other third parties is this wonderful sense of adventure that I think is lost in the, in where Watsi's going with the adventures that they're currently Corporatism. running. Um, and, you know, and, you know, des, you know, designed by committee, that kind of stuff. And, 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 and the proof is in the pudding, um, you know, the, my, my son and his friends, you know, they're, they're 13, 14, 15, all the way up to 18 years old. They love this, your games and other third party games far more than, than what Watsi's producing. Um, oh, and, sweet. Yeah. And, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the honest God truth because they're, they're, they're kind of of the same vein. They're like, cause you know, they, they started with, with the original, you know, 5e stuff. And they, as they've kind of rolled through it, they, it's, they become, God, this is, this is just a lot of, you know, this is long winded. This is nonsense. It's taking forever to do this. We just want to have fun and go adventuring you know, and they want the action bits and cut out the boring bits. Right. And we don't want everything to be an adventure path from one to 20. And we just, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And even if they're just using it for bits of information, you know, or, or pulling it for their own, you know, homebrew campaign, they're going to these sources to uh, supplement their 5e than what Watsi's even doing. Um, and, and once again, this is not a slight against the 5e rule set at all. Um, or, and, and I, I, we're not going to get any sort of political nonsense here at all. This is not a slide against all the people who are upset over the other nonsense that they're upset about. Changes to different rule sets, you know, <sighs> races and all that stuff. Uh, that's fine. That's all, that's all for other people to argue about. The only issue that I really have is it's just, it's just become uninspired and boring, uh, at least in my opinion, wh- where they're going with that. So, so this to me is what keeps 5e interesting uh, as far as why I would continue to use that rule set and ha- don't have a problem running it. If it was just 5e and what Watsi was providing us, I probably wouldn't have, I would have stopped running it a couple of years ago uh, just because it's like, <sighs> well, I have a, I have a dirty little secret. Um, yeah. So <laughs> um, I own the monster manual, the player's handbook and the dungeon master's guide for right. 5e. Okay. And that's it. Um, right. And that's not a slight on on Watsi. Again, yeah. I'm very grateful to to, to Watsi because they let small publishers like myself dip our mm-hmm. you know wet our beak and get a, get a little taste of the action. You know, yep. um, so I have nothing. I have nothing but great things to say about about, about Watsi. However, mm-hmm. um, I haven't checked out any of the published everything right. that I own. Edition party, every mm-hmm. single bit of it. Right. Um, I mean, not not that I haven't picked up the books and, and looked at them, or that I would I, that I won't at some point. Of course, of right. course, I probably will. But yeah. um, I can only buy so many copies of a Forgotten Realms book, or right. a, a you know a Spelljammer, or Dark Star, or, you know, whatever Ravenloft, for instance. Right. And third, I've got that. Um, so I'm more interested in like a perspective mm-hmm. creator have one it's just that um i'm just looking for something new and something right. different so um i end up finding a lot of 5 E stuff kickstarter and through indiegogo and yes. um you know things like that and you, and you find stuff at conventions or uh, a friend will recommend something to you mm-hmm. um you know like the I, I think the the best um fifth edition adventure probably in the last i don't know three or four or five years mm-hmm. um a lot of people haven't even heard of, you know, and that this, the, the ne- necromancer games without this module called, um, encephalon gorgers from the moon. Um, it was written. It, it's, it's, nope. it's, it's awesome. So like, okay. if you ever, if you ever see that bounce around a con, pick that up because the stuff that got shoehorned. And I mean that in a good way, not, a, not, not the bad way, the stuff right. that got shoehorned and put together, uh, in a, the way that it did and the narrative, and the way that it plays is just brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Until so Cephalon Gorgeous from the Moon. You see that bouncing around a con? Make sure you pick that up. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I mean, yeah, I just and, and I I didn't want this to take a turn down, you know, that path no. or whatever. But no, but we I don't just, want to be I, negative. Yeah. No, no, exactly. Uh, no, 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 and that's a, no, no, not at all. But 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 I do I did want to, to to reiterate that, and I don't think it's being negative saying that. Hey, you know. Watsi is doing things. Yeah, you know, they're a corporation. They're doing things that they need to do to to maintain the, you know, what what they're doing now. And that's that's the 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 last thing I'll say about it. But uh, you know, just like we all are, we're all 
critics, whether we are, you know, have a website or just personally, and we know what we like, we know what we don't like. And, and, th- and that's been true of D and D through every iteration at a certain point, you know, someone's going to complain about, well, you know, uh, first edition, you know, when, when it started sure. Peter out and then second edition came around and then, you know, the, inundation I'm waiting on sixth edition. So it's yeah, okay. The, the slap books. And then the, you know, the, the, the over ridiculous amount of D 20 stuff that came out and so on and so forth. And, and fourth edition, which, you know, Hey, guess what? Fourth edition is coming back more power to them. Um, and, and, <laughs> and so on. And it might well, listen, it man, might, in, yeah. in 30 years, they're going to be griping about this, you know, well, that's, yeah, that's, exactly, and that's exactly. fine. Exactly. That's, that's fine. That's, 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 whatever moves us forward as a hobby, I'm, I'm all here for it. Right. Absolutely. So, so speaking of moving forward, yep. so mm-hmm. you had teased <laughs> about a he's East Coast, New York. That's that's how he is. <laughs> what? <Well, Thank> <laughs> <laughs> no. So seriously, though, you had teased yeah. about a uh, box set. Mm. I did. Um, yeah. You want to you want to spill the beans a little more? <laughs> or are you going to hold that one close? Well, I, I, I got to hold it close. I can tease that right, a little right. I, I can I can tease that a little bit. Um, okay. And that that we you know that that won't be coming out until until next year and late okay. next year because that 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 one's a lot of work and I've only I've only uh, just started on it, but um, it'll be my first full uh, full scale um, campaign setting, not okay. in like a way like Forgotten Realms or Greyhawk as a campaign setting, but uh, uh, where there's enough material for someone to run a longer style game you know like you can pick up my, my stuff now and you know even the biggest of the books um skullcano island you mm-hmm. know that's going to be six seven eight sessions at most you know it's high level so you know those uh those adventures go pretty fast um mm-hmm. and the smaller ones are two three sessions you know um and the factories each have the one session you know kind of kind of games or hex crawls in them mm-hmm. but this one this one is something that you, you'll be able to sit down with and run an extensive campaign with uh, for a long time if if that's your if that's your jam you know so more meat on the bones per se right. a lot of meat on the bones okay. and then and again I always wanted to do a box set you know um, oh, my okay. friend Zach Zach Glazier um, he always tells me he says because uh, he he did a box set that was the very first thing he ever did uh, and it was amazing but he he he'll he'll, he'll tell you like don't do a box set <laughs> like <laughs> you because know, his his you know his box set had you know all these booklets and dice and you know he, figure figures and you barely oh, close yeah. it. Like, like you pull it out you can barely close that's and it's a good one too so if you ever see a, a box set called whisper and venom yeah uh, b- bouncing around a, a con that's another one that is just chef's kiss it's good yeah. stuff yeah no that you're not wrong on that one that's good stuff yeah. there <laughs> yeah. scott's making notes i can see this oh absolutely <laughs> yeah the, the, and so. this will this will all be in, in, in you know in, in the show notes and whatnot too you know the, the best that we can but yeah right. like I like leading people into discovering other things. So yeah, absolutely. But, but, so I appreciate I, I, you teasing, you know, teasing no, that out a little bit more. So I can't I, give, too, I can't give away too much, um, but listen, there's, there's a bunch of stuff coming this year that I can't talk yeah. about. So, okay. Sure. What's that? Uh, <laughs> on the spot. Uh, no, no problem. So Almost. you were talking about, you were talking about uh, magic and shit earlier. There's a sequel. Yeah. There's a oh, sequel there coming. Yeah. So magic oh. and shit is magic and shit. Uh, was a 48 page zine that was kind of like an ode to metal edge and, uh, you yes. know, all, all those yeah. metal magazines that you would, you know, you'd see on the stands, uh, yeah. but seen through kind of like an RPG lens, you know? Um, so the, 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 it, the focus on that one was magic items and kind of relics and things like that. Well, the second one is all about, it's, it's all about spells, you know, spells mm-hmm. and rituals and, you know, that sort of thing. And it's called vulgar display of magic. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, it's got a yeah, it's got a really, really cool cover to it that I think uh will work for people on on many levels. Um, and it's fully illustrated by a great artist named Phil Stone. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Phil, um, but he's done work for Magic the Gathering, he's done uh, yeah. a bunch of really, really cool um demon codex, like demon lord and like devil codexes. Mm-hmm. Uh, he actually ran just ran a Kickstarter on um on a I ran a crowdfunding on Kickstarter uh, right. and they are amazing looking like he look up Phil stone. He is great. I hope to be working with that guy a lot in coming up in the future because um, he has a real, like, I don't know, just like a real unique aesthetic and a totally punk vibe and very, very uh, indie feel to him. And he's just a joy so far to work with. 
uh, and to communicate with. He's just a, a, you know, he's one of those guys who is a, he's an artist and an illustrator, you know, okay. He can, yeah, he, man, nice. he can, he can draw like you, you put like the bare minimum of the description down and say, all right, man, just make it look cool. But then on top of that, um, he knows how to turn work in on time and on spec. And, you know, he's not just one or the other, you know, he's, he's not just an illustrator who might just turn in something dry or an right. artist who turns in something really cool, but it's hard to use it. He's both. Um, and he's, yeah, he's fantastic. So looking forward uh, to, to doing that with him uh, for vulgar display of magic. Then af- I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. A- after that, there's, there's uh, two modules coming in rapid succession. Mm-hmm. Um, one is called three curses for sister Saren. Okay. And it's a smaller, uh, more like kind of the, the, the page count of say like, uh, Ion King was right. Um, and, uh, that, that I'm, I'm doing that one with, uh, a, a great writer named Mike Lee, uh, who I met at North Texas RPG con, um, mm-hmm. got some great illustrations for that already. Great cover by Adrian Landeros. Who's done all the, all the module covers. Mm-hmm. Um, super, super talented. That guy. Oh, God, um, yes. Are these going to be Kickstarters di- or are these going to be oh, yeah, direct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All Kickstarters. Yeah. Um, and then, well, actually, actually, you know what? They're not all Kickstarters because I do have a couple smaller projects that are going to go to Indiegogo this year. Um, as I want to kind of test the waters over there. I got one called uh, <laughs> Big Eye Chungus. <laughs> you, tell? you can't call beholders a beholder. You can't do oh, that because that's against yeah. the rules, man. That is, uh, yeah, that is says, a trademark thing. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing says you can't call him a big eye chungus. So, uh, yeah. Wow. So I've got a book about uh, that. It, you know, uh, quotation marks in the air. And it's right. definitely not about beholders. Of course not. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So, so that's coming. And there's, there's some more. Zines. Sign me up. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a bunch of stuff. A bunch of stuff's coming. I'm excited. So, I, I'm yeah. excited. And you, you do, I mean, speaking of your artwork, you do kind of, you do re, reutilize and, and use a lot of these, these artists again and again, and, and for good reason. I mean, these, and are these people that originally that you knew, or did you just kind of reach out to them and, or just kind of said, I have a project who wants to submit something for it? Cause you know, you, you've, you've got like, like, like you had mentioned, like you had mentioned, sorry, I backed away from the mic, but like, you know, uh, Adrian Landeros, Ed Bickford, uh, you know, is it, is it J Shields, G Shields? It's uh, James. I think it's James E Shields, but he goes by J E Shields. Yeah. J E Shields. Yeah. You know, these, these names reoccur in, in, you know, a lot of your books and with, with good reason. So are, so are these just like, just people who are like, you know, Hey, I'm, man, I'm going to create something. I need artists, you know, and I don't know how to reach out to them how did you get, how did you feel these people to kind of, you know, come to you and, and do this artwork? Did you know them or this is just, this kind of a, you know, just. Sure. Uh, no. Mm-hmm. It, it, so Adrian, uh, who I've worked with the most, I've worked with him since the very first one and continue right. to work with him, you know, all, you know, hopefully as, as long as we can, we can keep him interested in, in RPGs mm-hmm. before a, a software company snatches him up. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, um, yeah. I've worked with him since day one and uh, love, love that guy. Yeah. Um, but he, I got hooked up with him. He was a student of my friend, Casey Christofferson's. Yeah. Uh, so Casey in his day job is an art teacher. And oh, um, okay. he says, listen, I got this kid. I've used him a couple of times, but I just don't have enough work for him right now. You know, we got, you know, we, you know, we have dozens of artists that we use. So, you know, we have to parse things out I said, but I think he might be good for your, for your project. So we worked together. He did um, all of the illustrations for, for Jungle Tomb of the Mummy Bride, the, the very first one. And man, I just loved everything he did. It was, he was a joy to work with. He was just, a, a, he, I think he was only 18 at the time too. Like he's just a great kid. Um, so, uh, so we would just work together, you know, ever since, you know, I, I hit him up every couple of months. Hey man, how you doing? Here's your comp copies for the, all the cool stuff you did. You know, I think he's got something in literally in every book, except maybe just a handful of the zines. I think maybe there's a couple right. of the, the most latest scenes that he doesn't have anything in, but, um, but Ed Bickford, mm-hmm. I also got introduced to through Casey. Casey ran into him at a comic book show in Kansas city and uh, really liked the style. And I was looking for somebody to draw robots and machinery for um, Howling Crater. Right. And he's like, I think I got a guy for you. Um, yeah. So these two great artists that I work with, again, I owe it all to Casey, you know, and right. they, they are both very, very um, talented and great artists to work with. I can't really can't say enough th- great things about either one of them. Now, um, uh, James Shields, J.E. Shields, um, mm-hmm. he does a lot of stock art. 
you know, he has a whole okay. whole website that he is dedicated to doing stock art for the RPG um, hobby. Right. Um, and, at, and when I say a lot, I mean, like, I honestly don't know anybody who has more <laughs> RPG stock art out there. <laughs> it's thousands and thousands of pieces. And, and you oh. know, he's got a really clean and uh, really um, detailed style, with which, which I appreciate, you know, as a guy who read comics coming up and like stuff by John Byrne and George Perez mm -hmm. and Todd McFarlane. That was, those were my guys, you know, when I was right. a teenager, uh, he has a very similar style where it's really clean. Mm -hmm. um, so I work with him a lot, but I, I you know, I also uh, try to get um, stuff from him that is not, uh, not just stock art, you know, but right. he's such a nice guy that, you know, um, it's, 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 you know, it's just effortless to work with, or, you know, to work right. with him. He's such a nice man. So, um, you know, and there's, listen, there's a handful of other guys uh, mm -hmm. too that are, you know, just always, um, you know, always down to do something cool. Right. Uh, you you, you were one of my, if I knew, if I, ahead, if I knew any of them from before, the only one that I can really think of that I, that I knew before um, is uh, Lawrence Hernandez, who's my best friend in high school. He just happens to be okay. a fantastic artist, but you know, he has a job and a wife, kids career, you know, so it's, it's hard um, to always connect with him on right on a piece in, in a timely manner, you know, cause he, like I said, he's got a life. Um, but when we do, we, we did it with magic and shit and Skullcano Island and uh, mm -hmm. a few other things. It's almost always awesome. He does right. those. Um, if you look at the back of the phylacteries, he does those save versus disbelief comics. Yeah. In which are basically, you know, the, uh, you, you know, if you've ever seen them, you know, they're the, uh, the Ripley's Ripley's. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the Ripley comics. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I collected those. I had the, the little the little digest ones that wouldn't i mean they're smaller than this but they were the little little digest comics oh, yeah. you would you would get and it would be it would be just a reprints of the old ripley's you know oh yeah uh, see magazines from uh earlier but uh they would you know throw about eight or nine of them and just collected the hell out of those until they were lost or sold <laughs> oh yeah he and i both grew up on those man we love them <laughs> yeah oh well keith do you have something else because i i was going to ask another question here um I uh, know. I'm just geeking out, man. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's so I, and, and, and I will add, and I just want to kind of throw this out because I, I, I can't, you know, express enough. You do have, you know, occasionally one of the, I consider one of the hardest working men's men in the hobby, uh, Diogo uh, Noguera. You have oh yeah. Yeah. Books. Um, that, that man is a freaking machine. He is uh, an absolute it, like machine. Yeah. No, no, and, no joke. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm it, actually really glad you brought him up because I've mm -hmm. worked with him on a couple different things and not only is he a great artist mm -hmm. but he's a great writer yeah. um yeah he wrote uh he wrote some really good stuff in the dcc uh compatible version of uh the jungle tomb and the mummy bride which right. is li literally filtering out the backers as we speak like it's shipping now so so people are getting like i, I sent uh goodman their their supply today so okay. um check your mailbox got it. you're looking yeah, for I, yours I, I i i'm about to send my son out to go check the mail yeah of course uh <laughs> But yeah, so I'm, well, that's, that's, that's if, like I said, I, I think I made the joke the other day when you announced it and, and I kind of said, yeah, mine should be coming. Pause. Did I fill out the backer kit? Fuck. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh yes, I did. Okay. Soon. Uh, <laughs> which I yeah, no, uh, Diogo is a gem. He's a super mm -hmm. nice guy and he's a great collaborator. Um, and it, one of the things that I really like that he does is he shines a light on, um, independent publishers and small creators you know um i found so many cool things because he you know he posted it and then i hit him up via dm hey man like give me give me a little bit more info like is it really as good as you're saying and he's like oh yeah you know and then i find you know something like into the weird and wild yeah. you know i don't know if you have that or not but that was mm -hmm. literally the best thing that i bought last year um oh. it's fantastic but yeah no it's it I, a little bit of a trivia here. Diogo was the first uh, GM who ran a game for me that I played online. It was during oh, nice. uh, during one of the gauntlet uh, cons of the the online cons, and and he was offering a um, his solar blades and cosmic spells, and and I just I jumped on that as quick as I could. Uh, I had Smart no move. idea what I was doing. I, I had never played a game online at, at the time. And I just kind of, oh, what, what am I doing? And of course, I think, I think he admitted, I don't know what I'm doing either. This is my first time too, I think. <laughs> so, I mean, it was one of those things where it's like, you know, me, but it was me and like three other people and it, and it went really well, but, uh, 
it, it was kind of like the whole like how do we do this i, I don't know fuck i'll just roll dice i, I promise <laughs> i won't i <clears throat> promise i won't lie uh but yeah so that yeah so that's 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 fantastic i mean you, you've got yourself a you know sounds like a, a great just just group of people that, that not only can share the you know the burden that you can lean upon and and rely upon and and i'll be perfectly honest you know some of the things some of the stories do kind of have that that you evoke that wonderful kind of like little bit of tsr beginnings of like you know yeah there's a friend of mine who has this artist who's still in high school and he started doing <laughs> art the the network magazine. thing yeah exactly yeah. so it's 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 going to it's going to throw a little bit of nostalgia feeling in, in that so listen right you, I, i'm lucky enough to get adrian landeros to do my covers and some interiors for me now mm -hmm. but in mm -hmm. you know it, like i said it's not gonna be long before he gets snatched up but in, in 20 years if he's still mm -hmm. doing rpg work it will be top tier it'll yeah. i mean he's only got upwards to go um he's already very very good mm -hmm. but you know yeah. he, he the sky is the limit for that guy Re real quick i want to mention yep. one, one other mm -hmm. person that is 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 uh very integral to the whole planet x scheme and that yeah, is uh, my, is my partner uh tracy Steele, who is the graphic designer and layout for the books ah, she creates okay. the logos she's uh you know a 20 plus year vet of graphic design and layout work um but it is her personality um mm. that really helps hold everything together like she you mm. know she's she's yes she's a fantastic graphic designer she does great work she's very timely um but man she's got such a a, a good personality she's so easy to work with um never a problem, never a, a, never grumpy, never, you know, always a hard worker. Well, I mean, sometimes she falls asleep doing, you know, she works all day, got kids, you know, she's got, got the, the whole home life thing going on. And then, you know, she's up till two 30 in the morning working on my dumb, weird you know, fantasy stuff, you know, half, half, half asleep at the, <laughs> the monitor, you know? Uh, so I, I can't, I really have to mention her because she really is, um, a big part of the glue that holds everything together. She's, she's amazing. So Tracy, so, if you're listening, you're awesome. And, and, Tracy, and, you're and, awesome. There. And, and Tracy, don't get upset if we de delete this because that's just going to make us all look bad. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so we'll probably, we're, we're going to wrap it up here in just a minute, Levi. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, God, it's been an hour, believe it or not, that, that we've been, know, that we've been right? chatting. Yeah. Holy crap. Um, but, but uh, just, just a couple of things we'll, we'll kind of, you know, uh, lead, lead off with is, uh, to you, what does hashtag war Duke Wednesday mean to you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do tell, do tell, you know, uh, years ago I saw that hashtag on, uh, on Instagram. I, mm -hmm. I just started, um, my Instagram page up and man, like, this dude, I don't even remember who it was. I don't remember where it came from, but this guy kept posting pictures of, of War Duke every Wednesday with hashtag War Duke Wednesday, mm -hmm. you know, like, and I was like, oh, I've never seen half these pictures of War Duke. And they would, people were, you know, coming in and, you know, they were, they were dropping their own uh, pictures of War Duke that they drew and computer images, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. And now, like, he has blown up. Yeah. Like, he went from nobody cared about War Duke to like, oh my God. Like War Duke is awesome. There's a Funko Pop of War Duke. There are like five different kinds of miniatures. There is a in, insanely hilarious um, fa a comic fanzine called really? More Duke. Called yeah, it's called More Duke. It's about a, oh. an overweight an overweight War Duke. Um, <laughs> wow, they got me. <laughs> no, it's awesome. It's by, it's by this great creator named Eric Smith. Uh, if you go on uh, Instagram and look at uh, his his tag is um, Full Blown Ink. Mm -hmm. Look up, yeah. Look up more Duke. Um, it's it's hilarious, and I've I've got the first two issues of the Zine, and it's fantastic. So, that's yeah, that's that's my War Duke Wednesday story. Excellent. One more thing be, be, be before before you run is um, so uh, some people may not know that because they don't follow, follow they may or may not follow you online and whatnot. But if someone was to ask Levi, what would be my introduction? to grindhouse what movie would you recommend to them oh man that's a great question uh, now are you so are you talking grindhouse grindhouse or are we talking like b movies too or like like what bad we'll, movies we'll kind of we'll kind of throw it all together because they, they they do kind of touch on on each other but you know for someone who's just like hey you know i've heard about these like for my son you know let's let's put we'll just say for my son he's he's 15 years old 
he's probably sat through a couple, but I mean, let, let's put, let's, he's 15. He doesn't want to hang out and watch movies with his dad right now. But, <laughs> he wants to hang he, out but, with his buddies. But, but, but if him and his buddies were going to go to, well, they're not going to go to the VHS store. If they were, if they were going to, if they were going to download, uh, steal a movie online, <laughs> what, 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 what torrent would they watch? <laughs> it, it, what, what, what would you recommend they watch if they were going to allegedly do something like that? Well, I'm definitely not recommending this to your 15 year old. So uh, right. when dad gets mad later on, it's not because of me. Right. But there are a couple of movies I'll just throw out there. Um, mm-hmm. Again, they're they're not uh, all of them aren't, aren't necessarily grindhouse films because that is a very specific yes. from this date to this date. Um, but because you have canon films and all kinds of B, B movies and mm-hmm. all kinds of nonsense. But um, I would definitely say um, Troll 2, not Troll oh, God. 1, God, but yes. Troll 2. Um, is just one of the greatest cinematic experiences you'll ever have in your life. Um, Samurai Cop is another one. Oh if God, you've man. never seen Samurai Cop, man, you are in for a treat. Because, mm-hmm. um, because man, that's got some stuff in it, uh, and it's a lot of fun. Um, uh, and you know, if you want to go strictly grindhouse again, The Warriors. You can't go wrong with God, the God. classic The Warrior. Everybody thinks that that was a that that was like a um, you know, big budget thing, but no, that was something that, you know, that grew from, from, you know, word of mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we're going to go horror, we're going to go uh, horror grindhouse mm-hmm. films. Um, you can't go wrong with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Again, one that everybody thinks was a big budget thing, but was not mm-hmm. Arb- arguably the greatest horror movie ever made. It's, it's definitely up in contention with the top three. And then mm-hmm. Halloween, same deal was another one yeah. of those very low budget, you know, and those are ones people, everybody's seen, everybody knows, but, mm-hmm. um, they're, those are definitely grindhouse films, yeah. All right, I love it. I love it. Now I got to <laughs> yeah. go like watch some movies later. Yeah, I, I, I think we need to have you back on and not talk about RPGs, but just talk, about, talk about movies. Talk about those movies. Talk. Oh about, my you know, gosh! Be, so I, that would be like my dream podcast would be to sit down with you guys and talk not about nothing but but grindhouse flicks and exploitation movies and genre movies. I, All right, I so do... Scott, make a note. We need to get Levi and Alex together oh, yes <laughs> let's do it. have an episode on nothing but like b movies and grindhouse and exploitation films yeah, yeah if, if you if you if you're not aware of it if you haven't checked it out i, I don't know if you enjoy or you, or you play call of cthulhu oh yeah but, uh, but 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 check out if you haven't already a uh, highway of blood oh yes um and, oh, and other so things. I, I i love yeah. i love that module yeah oh yes yeah yeah, I, yeah. are you talking about alex bates no, no, no. Uh, um, um, oh my God, I'm gonna butcher his name. Um, I know, Alex. We're sorry. Uh, uh, it's Alex. <laughs> I know. We just call him Alex. Um, um, uh, hold on, hold on. You got it, Keith. I, hold on, I got it right here. I got his <laughs> no, other. No, I, I, I love that. So I talked to. Um, fantastic. Uh, is uh, it's one of the co-creators? His name is Ian, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ian it's it's yeah, Alex uh, Galat. Yeah, I talked to I talked to Ian several years ago, and he's like, hey. It seems like we're into the same stuff. Check out my module. So I just went on drive through and bought it. And I was like, oh, I yeah, love yeah. this. This, this is, is their latest co- module right here. Nice. Yeah. What is that? Uh, Carnival Car- of Madness. Carnival of Madness. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a sucker for Carnival. And oh, my God. Yeah. They're doing a trilogy. <clears throat> they, they did nice. like this kind of grindhouse trilogy it takes place in the 70s. I, I ran um, the the uh, Highway of Blood for Keith and other people I, oh, yeah. on, a, on a friend's stream um and it fantastic. It, it's it's a blast it's an absolute blast so yeah when they asked me uh, to edit this i i couldn't turn it down I mean, oh this, no this man it was definitely stuff. it i love that cover oh, but but no yeah it's i mean amazing shit. i mean t- titter pigs doesn't just have to be about ttrpgs we, no know, no I mean, we're we're gonna we're gonna take you up on that dude we're yeah. gonna we're gonna bring you back we're gonna to. get alex and we'll get ian and we're gonna have uh, an uh, educational uh, episode. Grindhouse Grindfest. <laughs> oh, We're going to have a Grindfest. Yeah. yeah. 100% down for so, that. 100. Excellent. Oh, listen, before yes. I forget, um, yep. you were asking about Grindhouse. So, uh, again, mm-hmm. I'm not going to mm-hmm. recommend the entire movie. Right. But the first 10 minutes of Ninja 3, The Domination, is perhaps one of the greatest things your eyes will ever behold. It's got ninjas jumping out of sand traps, uh, bench pressing golf carts crushing golf balls in the powder with their hand. I didn't know golf balls were made of powder, but uh, they, you know, it's, it's, it's one of our decapitations galore. Um, and a ninja takes like 500 gunshots to the chest and lives. It's wonderful. So, so the first 10 minutes of Ninja three, the domination. 
it, it sounds like you grew up near the same, uh, you know, VHS store that I grew up yes. to. So, I mean, it, it's just, just that, that stuff was like front nice. and center in the shelf every, every weekend. So fantastic. All right. Well, Keith. Well, yes. I think that's going to, that's going to end this episode. Uh, Levi, uh, on behalf of Titter Pigs, thank you for your time. Uh, yeah. telling us about your beginnings of venturing into the hobby. Mm -hmm. Uh, sounds like, um, our same kind of uh, Nexus stories for Scott and I. <laughs> um, very, very similar anyways. Uh, yeah. You know, thank you for telling us and listeners about uh, how Planet X games came about and your existing projects, your ongoing uh, Kickstarter project with Phylactery number four and uh, kind of teasing what, uh, what you got in the works. Uh, you got me excited. So, um, yeah. I have to. I'll have to keep an eye out on Indiegogo and Kickstarter, and uh, take a look at these things when they uh, when they hit. Uh, we'll get all this stuff in the show notes. Uh, mm -hmm. My secretary uh, named Scott has been taking copious notes uh, throughout the entire <coughs> conversation because Scott does our show notes. So thank you, Scott. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, oh, shit. Yeah, his one sticky. He's been taking uh, copious <laughs> notes. Uh, okay, yes, it's two sided, no. but it's one sticky. No, but, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But again, Levi, thank you for your time, yeah. uh, your patience at our shenanigans, and uh, I'm sure listeners will will enjoy the conversation we've had tonight. Yes. So, yes. no, this was an awesome hang, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank definitely you. want to have you back on again. And 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 likewise, just want to extend the invitation. Um, you know, we we do this kind of thing. We we'll just have chats every once in a while like this outside of it. If you're available, pop on because I mean you'll you'll see familiar faces and people who know your works and just like to talk about the same old stuff. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, the, the community exists outside of the podcast. So yep. definitely want to keep, you know, keep that vibe going, you know, not just here, but outside of it also. So for sure. Um, yeah. Well, there we go. Shit. We, we, we've done another, <laughs> another episode another, down another, another episode of titter pigs. We'll, we'll, you know, this is, this is, this is exciting. I, I think we, I think we found a groove. I mean, we're, we're so goddamn tired of talking to each other. We just need to get more people like you and, 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 and other people on here. Cause you know, it's just, oh, yeah. so, so we're not quietly sitting, you know, across each other at the dinner table, like a disgruntled married couple going, Hey, listen, so you, wait till, so what did wait, you play this week? You know what I listen to the game. See the, get, not to get to see, but get to listen to the next episode when we record live face to face. Yes. Yeah. Keep, keep us <laughs> coming out to California and we're, we're going to do a, we're going to do a live kind of, stream q a podcast so, so look, at the orcas dorcas studios yes at the, this <laughs> <laughs> so fantastic so levi really appreciate really appreciate it. I'm, I'm i'm so very glad that you that you popped on here so uh anything else you'd like to to add before we before we close close out to the no man here? this was this was a good hang man so so thank you again for having me on awesome. excellent excellent awesome all well, right everyone go ahead keith do you want to just roll us out to the next segment. Yeah, so out we go. We'll see you in the next segment where we are going to playing through some of our calls and mailbag stuff. We'll catch you over there. Excellent. everybody we are back with the your side of the mic segment this is the segment where we go through our mailbag uh we've checked all of our socials whether it be youtube twitter facebook uh email wherever we get it voicemails tinder wait what <laughs> tinder what wait a minute wow no. hold on i didn't know about that account uh Scott, anyway, we're gonna sorry, have to have go talk on. <laughs> uh, but anyways we'll, we'll talk uh we'll talk off the mic off the air anyways yeah. um so we've gone through and we want to take a few moments or a few minutes actually mm -hmm. and go through some of these um, emails and messages we received. Uh, we feel we owe everybody that has taken the time to send us in some messages or post mm -hmm. on our socials. You took the time to send us some love. We're going to send you some love. So absolutely. So Scott's going to okay. take it away. Yep. Okay. So. So the first view is going to be from our YouTube channel. We do have a YouTube side channel up where we use to post our, um, our, our podcast episodes after we've done them as another place for you to go listen. So if you aren't aware of it, go check it out. It's another format for you to enjoy the podcast rather than the What's YouTube? That method. Yes. So 
So first off, we have, this is from Gothridge Manor, and this is regarding episode six, Talking Zines with Andy Markham. Uh, Tim, which is Tim Shorts from Gothridge Manor, Manor, sorry, says, I really appreciate the serious stance about the pronunciation of zine. <laughs> and thank you guys for the kind words. Keep up the good work. So yes, we did mention uh, uh, Tim Shorts uh, and his contribution to what he does through his Patreon uh, and he also hosts a wonderful podcast called Gothridge Manor. So definitely check that out uh, when you get a moment. But to kind of reiterate, yes, Keith, it's zine, right? Right. Not zine. Right. Because I don't read so, magazines. I read magazines. Right. So thank, thank you, Time Shorts. I mean, shit. Tim Shorts um, <laughs> for that comment. All right, Keith, you get the next one. All right. Uh, the next one comes from Ryan Rank. And this is... Uh, for episode two, uh, the horror episode that we did. Mm -hmm. And Ryan had sent in, I was thinking about this horror as a genre thing. I'm not sure that I'm totally on board with that. Horror rarely appears in a game by itself. I think horror accompanies other genres. For instance, Those Dark Places is considered a horror game, but if you peel away the horror, it's sci-fi. Dark Conspiracy is horror-ish. Peel that away, and you have urban fantasy. If you peel away the sci-fi in those dark places, there's not really a game. Rip away the urban fantasy aspect of Dark Conspiracy. Again, there's not much of a game. Don't get me wrong. I love horror. I just think horror is more of a game flavor than a genre in itself. What flavors of a game do you guys like? Horror, uh, horror came up for both of you. Gritty like Simba Room. He's asking us. Uh, right. Epic high fantasy like old Dragonlance novels and setting. Dragonlance, bleh, sorry, I'm answering the questions as I go. Uh, this is really a good podcast, and I'm looking forward to the next one. Ryan, thank you for the comment. No, Keith does not like Dragonlance, never have. Uh, my wife does, but Keith does not. And it, 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 it is it is another wonderful take on you know what people think about horror sure, you know, in the RPG world and, and you know how it applies. So, so yeah, so yeah, thank you for that, Ryan. Uh, continuing on, the next few that we got here is going to be from our Twitter account, which is at TitterPigs on Twitter. Very easy to find us. Uh, pop on there, you know, give us a follow, and you'll be updated with, you know, when our podcasts come out. And likewise, the humor of both Keith and myself as, you know, we take turns taking over the uh, the posting for whenever we feel like it. So, Oh, yeah, it's fun. But, you, but you'll... But you'll never know who did what, you know, because we'll never admit it. We don't. Uh, we don't but uh, so, don't. yes, we have from at uh, Morthai. Is, is that how you would pronounce it? Um, sure. So this this is from Lee. This is from Lee Williams. Lee was uh, uh, a friend of ours that we talked to quite frequently uh, online, I believe. And um, and he's also in the pub quite a bit. He's done and some audio work for us, too. Done some audio work for us and also has a Titterpig shirt out there. Uh, so if you'd like to give Lee a little bit of support, you know, just, you know, I'm sure if you search Titter Pig's shirt, uh, you'll definitely see it and, and pick it up. We get nothing from it, by the way. It's just, nope. it's just for fun. We get nothing. Uh, so yes. So Lee writes in, and this is regarding episode six again, uh, talking scenes with Andy Markham. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. He says the mention of casting the runes reminds me that this might help set the mood for some MR James goodness. Apart from Monty, this chap also reads tales from his contemporaries, including Wells and even H.P. Lovecraft. And so what Lee is doing, he's recommending another site in that comment called Nunkey Films. Are you familiar with them at all, Keith? I am not, but I still need okay. to find some time to go check it out. What it is, it's the home of Nunkey Productions on YouTube. And what Nunkey is, is a literary storytelling unit committed to bringing to life the most thrilling short stories in the English language on stage and film. And he is right um, that uh, it does really evoke and set the mood for games such as, you know, Casting the Runes, especially, you know, as, as evocative as M.R. James could be. He definitely sets the mood himself. Uh, Keith is obviously more, um, you know, in tune with, with M.R. James and whatnot. But I, I think you would agree that, you know, M.R. James is definitely a specific type of ghost story. There's a, uh, there's a very particular vibe to M.R. James's right. work. Yes, absolutely. Right, and and they do evoke this with what they're doing on that YouTube channel. So, so thank you, Lee. Uh, really appreciate that. And if you get a moment, check out Nunkey Films. We'll we'll throw a link in the uh, you know in the description on the um, uh, on Anchor if you want to check it out there. But yeah, that's Nunkey N U N K I E Films. All right, our next one comes from Doctor Gonzo One Two Three. This is also uh, his. 
This individual's real name is Dennis Detwiller. Uh, Who? Yeah, the, yeah, that guy uh, from Art Dream Publishing and uh, one of the creators of one of our favorite games that we play reg- quite regularly. What was it again? I, I don't remember. You know, I only know Detwiller from the couple like cards that he did for uh, Magic the Gathering. I have no clue what else he's done. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes. Uh, oh, Anyways. that's right. Because you don't play. No, you play. It's, yes, it's Delta, Delta Green. Green. Delta Green. Yes, <laughs> it's Delta yes. Green. Because Scott and I have been playing in um, an ongoing um, Impossible Landscapes campaign. campaign so yes. Um, but anyways, uh, Dennis Detwiller uh, writes in uh, regarding episode four, Titter Pigs Year End Roundup Part One, our favorite games of 2021, with special guests Bud from Bud's RPG Review and Pookie from Reviews from Relay. And Dennis writes, waking to reviewers, picking your book as the best RPG product of 2021 is great. But what's even more great is to realize that they're actually playing through it and having a marvelous time doing so. So yes. what he's referring to is what I just said, uh, that the the four of us with another player are playing Dennis Detzweller's Impossible Landscape. So, yes, and- which which. Uh- I believe was not just Bud's um, favorite game of 2021, but I think it was listed as mine also. I believe that is and, correct. Yes. Yeah. So and we, we all we, had nothing we, but love for it. So as we players, on. as all as uh, game reviewers, influencers, we all had nothing but love for it. So you're welcome, Dennis. Uh, you know, it, it's 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 our pleasure to uh, to you know give you that that little bit of joy regarding your game and in hope that you get a lot more as it's well deserved. So absolutely. So next up we have, this is from our email, which is titterpigspod at gmail.com. Uh, this is where you can write in with whatever you want. But also, for those of you who want to send in a soundbite, it's an alternative to our call-in option on the, on the anchor.com uh, website or the app. If you feel like that you want to contribute a little bit more than something that may go longer than 60 seconds at a time. So by all means, you know, if, if you want to drop us a soundbite or a longer voicemail, you can send it as an attachment to titterpigspod at gmail.com. And so so this one was from a while back. Uh, this was from Graham Rowe, uh, who we highlighted in another uh, mailbag episode. Is it mailbag? Is that what we're calling it, mailbag? Uh, your or side from, of the from mic. Bo- your side of the mic, yes. Uh, he sent in a um, uh, an, an actual voicemail attachment, which we highlighted and addressed. It was, it was very atmospheric, so he took his time to create this, this wonderful thing. Uh, which which we you know listened to and commented on, but what accompanied that was an, an email that kind of touched base on other aspects of horror. So uh, Graham writes, "Hello Keith, Ta-da, that, that would be that's me. that's that's it." Um, yeah, he just wanted to give me a little bit of love. It's cool. <laughs> oh, that's right, because you you had played in a game with him. So. I had. Yep, we had just played at a or re- had recently played at an online game convention. Right. So he says, I can't believe it's been two months since our game of Brindlewood Bay. Uh, What a blast that was. Really enjoying the podcast. Just finished episode two and thought I would send you an audio thing about character agency. So yeah, so he he spoke about character agency and whatnot, which was one of our topics in the horror episode. Um, I don't know how many people pick up the microphone and do these things, so I thought that I would. Not enough. So please, send us more audio clips or whatever you like. We will, you know, it, we, I, I think it'd be awesome if we had an, a whole episode of this. So, but uh, maybe not. That's a lot of editing. So anyway, it's going on. <laughs> I don't, let's see. So I thought I would. I wish I'd heard about the Owlbear and Wizard Staff Convention. It sounds great. I might even get to attend that one day in person. And, you know, Owlbear and Wizard Staff is a con in the UK, which um, I believe is both physical and online. Right. Um, or maybe it's one of those that was physical has an online presence and now carries on doing both. Scott and I um, are looking for sponsorship so we can attend this year. Oh yes, please someone pay for us to fly to the UK. Would absolutely love that. We will. Um, yes. I've been running the between for my players for the last month. They seem to be really into it. I'm not sure I would ever have understood the wildly theorized move if I hadn't had Neil explain it. I have one player in particular who seems particularly skilled at using all the clues for every question. Uh, hoping all is well. Looking forward to your next episode. Cheers, Graham. So, Keith, give a little insight because I haven't played Brent, Brenda Wood Bay yet, yeah. but to, that I I know of the game. It's, right. It's, you know, it's wildly popular now. It uh, is but, actually. Uh, um, so let me preface everything. It's I think it's getting ready to come out on Kickstarter. Yes. Indiegogo. 
One yes. of the two. Jason, I'm not sure which. Jason Cordova, right? Jason yes, Cordova? Jason Cordova wrote it. Mm-hmm. And right now Good it's currently only available in PDF through DriveThruRPG. I actually mm-hmm. I just signed up through BackerKit last night, in fact, to be email mm-hmm. notification for when it goes live. I just don't know if it's going to be Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Or one um, of the, yeah, one of the others. It's or, hard to say. And, and or when. So, but really right. it's a, it's a, it's Jason's take on a Powered by the Apocalypse driven game. You play older women in a, like a seaside town. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really centered, you know, ba- it's supposed to be based in America, but you can put, you can really put it anywhere. It's, it's, it's transportable right. in that regard. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of like eighties, late seventies, early eighties mystery TV shows from, from the United States. Uh, think of um, Murder, She Wrote. That's really what its premise is. You know, Jessica Fletcher, that type of character, that's what all of the characters are playing. They're all from like this book club. And uh, so they're solving murder mysteries. But the other thing going for it is this kind of cult mythos rising horror tension underlying thing happening that plays out over a series of about 10 episodes or, or, or story arcs. Right. Some people like that part of it. Some don't. I could take it or leave it. But when I played okay. with Graham, uh, we played uh, Neil, uh, one of the guys that hangs out in the pub with us uh, in the Manchester mm-hmm. Arms on Friday nights, uh, ran ran it for us. And uh, at one of the conventions, I uh, he made it British centric. And this is right. long before Sue um, mm-hmm. had published her uh, Matrons of Mystery game, which is her version of a UK centric Brindlewood Bay without the mythos bit to it. We had a fantastic time. It was called the Great British Bake Off. And I, as an American, playing an American hippie, transported right. to England, I totally won the British Bake Off with my really bad <laughs> um, pound cakey fruit cake. Uh, I, I, right. I think I could like break bus windows with it. I mean, but we had a great time and, mm-hmm. and Neil was really good with the rules. And I know he took some time with Graham, like on the breaks right. and after the game and talked about rules because... The Between is another one of Jason's games that right. is uh, Brindlewood Bay is like the 1980s. Right. The Between is in the Victorian period and it has a okay. different vibe. It's still a murder mystery kind of thing without the mythos thing is my understanding. I haven't read it or played it yet, um, but it's another one of Cordova's games. Right. And with a very similar bent to it. Right. My, my understanding is, is Brindlewood Bay is a derivative of The Between and, you know, he was trying to use it as kind of a stepping stone to get people interested in the between and Brenda Woodway, you know, took off uh, uh, in I popularity. I think it came out the other way. I don't think. Really? My understand, as Keith understands it, and I could be completely wrong, mm-hmm. um, I didn't see or hear anything about the between until mm-hmm. after Brindlewood Bay had been published. It's it is one or the other uh sure. for sure. Agreed. So yeah, but yeah, but the between uh my my best description that I heard about it is uh is essentially if you like uh Penny Dreadful. Um sure, you yeah. know, that's that's kind, it's on kind my of radar. a take on it. Yeah, so like along I, with a million I, I other ha- books. I I own them both in PDF. I did purchase them both. They're they're, you know, they're incredibly affordable. It's just, you know, time yeah. Time and you know, t- there's just not enough time. So, True story. so yeah, so definitely check those out. You can find those on Drive Through RPG. Look for Jason's Kickstarter coming soon, uh, which you know I'm sure you can you know once again do a search for him and you can find notifications on yep. that. Yeah. So thank you, Graham, uh, for that. All right. The last one we've got is from Anchor. Uh, this was uh, voicemails left for us from a Carl Rodriguez in regards to episode four, Titter Pigs Year End Roundup Part One. Our favorite games of 2021 with Bud and Pookie. So mm-hmm. Carl left us uh, some great voicemails. Here you are. Hi, guys. I found your podcast due to Dennis Detwiller's tweet and about your end of the year review on games that you thought were the best games of 2021. I definitely have a lot of those, which is great because now i got to dust them off, reopen them, reexamine them, especially Children of Flame and Impossible Landscapes. And you've turned me on to some like the desanction and uh, the mothership product. And so I got to track those down as well. I'm glad that one of you picked Twilight 2000 as one of the best games. I've been really enjoying it since running a campaign in July. I'm running through the Polish tetralogy, I guess it is, the classic um, battle from Kalitz that leads you to Krakow and then to Vistula 
Warsaw and Black Madonna. So it's been really great. And uh, thanks for your podcast. Just some more on the Twilight 2000 products. It has been very easy to convert the older products from the first edition of Twilight 2000 into this new and current edition because of the graduation from A down to D and how you can have novice effectively to elite. So as was designated in the older edition, it's definitely very deadly. Most weapons will kill you. Well, even a pistol will kill you with two shots. And if you get a crit, you're probably sunk anyway. So um, yeah, it's, you're not going to survive more than one shot and be taken down from any heavy caliber weapon. But uh, I guess it is as it should be. It's pretty gritty. The players have become savvy and do not get into fights that they uh, only get, that they only get into fights that they can control. So um, yeah, it's a, I really enjoy the system. Just to answer a little bit more, someone who's played the multiple editions, I would say one, it's not as U.S. focused. My wife plays a Polish partisan. And we have someone else who's playing a German agent. So and I think that kind of happened in the third edition of the game, the Twilight, I think 2013 or something, where you could play civilians and it wasn't so focused on the military. It does definitely does not go into as much detail in the guns as the previous edition, especially the first edition, where there are like actual books on U.S. and NATO military weapons, U.S. and NATO vehicles. Soviet military weapons, Soviet vehicles. And those books are a great reference. You can still get them through uh, Mark Miller's company as a, a thumb drive, like all the products, including Apocrypha. And they're really great references, but not needed for the game. All right, Carl, thanks for the voicemails uh, on some of the new games that uh, you might have to dust off on your shelves that you've, you've purchased, but haven't uh, taken the time to really dig into. And but more importantly, thanks for taking the time to to give us uh, a call and leave yep. us those um, uh, your tips and your experiences with Twilight 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, I think listeners will really appreciate the adaptability of the new game, especially uh, if they head over to Mark Miller's website, grab one of those thumb discs or one of those. I think you can also get them on DVD, Scott. Yep. Or CD-ROMs. Um, mm -hmm. I think Wayne's book sells them too. Mm -hmm. It's all the old stuff. So for the different editions. So and it, apparently it's pretty adaptable. So, man, I'm yeah. going to go buy more books. So yeah. thanks, yep. Carl. Thank you, Carl. Uh, <laughs> but if you, uh, like Carl, if you'd like to call in and leave us a voicemail, uh, you can go over to Anchor uh, to our Titter Pig site there and just hit that record button. It's, it's quite easy in the app. Mm -hmm. uh, again, like Scott mentioned previously, you can um, record your own audio bit and email it to us. Yep. So there's two ways to do that. And Absolutely. we'd love for you guys to do it. Absolutely. And just remember, it's only 60 seconds on Anchor. So, you know, either make it quick or be ready to do multiple ones. All right. Well, that's going to wrap up this uh, episode seven. Yes. Um, God, it's been a lot of fun, man. It has. It really has. I, I really enjoyed the conversation we had with Levi. I am definitely that was fantastic, man. Oh, Levi's awesome. High energy. Yep. High speed, low drag, man. Yep. Looking forward to having him back on again. We, we, we've, we've scored some gold, gold here with a couple of interviews so far. Andy was great. Levi was great. Ian and Alex was great. So hopefully we got a we couple can... more good ones coming up. Yes, we do. We, we do. And there may be some surprises on top of that. So Heck yeah. um, I think I'm I think a few. Yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> well, I think, you know, on behalf of you, Keith, and, and likewise me, I'd like to thank everyone for, you know, joining us on, you know, another episode of Titter Pigs, number seven. All right. I guess we'll see everybody in uh, episode eight. getting paid for this one.